so strong, ye clouds that sail in heaven along. Oh, praise Him, hallelujah. Thou rising moon in praise rejoice, ye lights of evening find a Blessings on our way. Oh, praise Him. Alleluia. The flowers and fruits that in thee grow, let them His glory also show. Oh, praise Him. Oh, praise Him. Alleluia. kind and gentle death, waiting to hush our latest breath. Oh, praise Him, alleluia. Thou leadest home the child of God, and Christ our Lord the way hath trod. Oh, praise Him, oh,
have searched me you know my way even when I fail you I know you love me your holy presence so I bow my knee where your blood was shed for me. There's no greater love than this. You have overcome the grave, your glory fills the highest place. What can separate? Turned on. It's on. You're on six. Well, I don't know. Oh, okay. Yeah. Anyway, we'll try it again. Good morning. Good morning. Glad that you're here today and uh, good to see a few that I know have been traveling or back and good to see each one of you here today and uh, hope that uh, you'll just enjoy a blessing today. Uh, as being a part of us. If you're here visiting today, we're glad, we're honored that you're here with us today. And uh, if you look around and see somebody you don't know, you be sure to not let them get out of here without a welcome and a handshake. Um, let's just, uh, since it's Independence Day weekend, uh, let's just start by singing My Country Tis of Thee, shall we? Let's stand together as we sing My Country Tis of Thee. My country tis of the sweet land of liberty, of thee I sing. Land where my fathers died, land of the pilgrims' pride, of every mountain, sun, and freedom ring. 
Scott. One, two, three. Oh, they're coming out of the woodwork. Well, congratulations. <laughs> All right. All kinds of birthdays this morning. All right. Where's Debbie? I haven't seen Debbie come down yet. Did she go? Okay. All right. Well, anyway, let's sing happy birthday to him, shall we? Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear friends. Happy birthday to you. You may be seated. We're going to have a word of prayer to start the service off. Then I'm going to dismiss Junior Church. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer, shall we? Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege of prayer. We thank you for the opportunity we have to gather in this place today. We pray, Father, for your presence, the blessing of your presence to be with us. We pray, Father, that you will guide every thought, every action, every word, that your name will be glorified in all that's said and done. Father, we don't seek in any way to glorify ourselves. But, Father, we know that it's you that deserves all the praise and the glory. Teach us what you desire us to know this morning. And we'll give you all the praise for it. Be with our service. Be with those who couldn't be here today, Father, for whatever reason. Uh, Father, we miss them. Watch over them. Keep them safe. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Junior church is dismissed. We have a program. Elizabeth, come here. The couple that's sitting clear on the back pew, just to go back and explain to them that we have a program for children down in the basement. If the children would like to go down, you'll... All right. Um, I want to take a minute and go over a couple of announcements. Um, First of all, if you have any prayer requests and you're watching online, uh, if you want to, you can send those prayer requests in through our comments section, and we'll be sure to get to those in just a minute when we do our prayer requests. But we want to take a moment, and uh, you know what? Before we get to the announcements, I think I want to do this. I, I didn't think Leon and, and Delmas would be back up here this quick. But uh, yesterday, and the day before, but primarily yesterday, uh, but for Friday evening and all day Saturday, most of Saturday, Leon and Delmas were with me in Fairmont at the second annual Covenant Brethren Church annual meeting and worship conference. And uh, I was with the youth most of yesterday, and so I didn't get to see most of what went on in the conference. So I asked Leon and Delmas if they would just come and give a quick report of uh, what went on and just share some things that to them were the highlights of the conference. So if you guys would come at this time and share that, I'd appreciate it. This was the building that we met in. It's called the Falcon Center, and uh, that's on the screen there. And so that's where the meeting was at. Well, I'm not a speaker. You all know that, but I'll try to do what I can here. Uh, Leon says I have to go first. Uh, so I, he, I guess the butterflies can get out of his belly. <laughs> but anyway, it was a, I've never been to a Brethren Conference, um, so I don't know what the difference might be. I've been to the to district conferences, and uh, but that's totally different. This is a much bigger deal, and uh, I would just say that overall. It, it was, I don't know how to word it, it was just a very different experience. Uh, you don't meet, you don't look up, there's like 270 people there. You don't look up that someone's not smiling and, and saying God bless you or um, saying good day or something. 
uh, very positive attitude. Speakers, there's, there's, uh, I don't know how many speakers. I could look in this book I got here and tell you some of them, but there's an awful lot of good, high-powered speakers. Seven. Seven? Does that include our pastor? No, yes. <laughs> you better. <laughs> but at, at any rate, it, it was an awful lot of information given out. Uh, we couldn't take the time to stand up here, two days worth of it. Now, I'm going to tell you, it's, 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 it was tiring. I'm not going to lie about it. It was very tiring. Uh, we covered so much, and then, but there was a lot of worship. It was not just a, a, a business trip. It was also a worship trip, and there was a lot of good worship, a lot of good singing, uh, and, uh, and all that takes a lot of time, and you sit and you sit. We didn't take breaks, per se. Uh, you were just instructed at, at any time if you needed to get up and go to the bathroom, whatever, go. But it wasn't going to take the time to have recesses, we'll call it that. So it was, it was pretty tiring if you tried to stay there, and, and, but it was very good. It was all good. Now, I don't, the theme of this conference was for such a time as this, taken from Esther 4.14. You all know the story of Esther. I'm, I'm not going to get into all the numbers and stuff. You can do that. But I'm going to tell you what, what, you know, I was putting together some numbers and things or looking through my notes, but but no, no, I, this morning, I like to get up on Sunday morning and, and uh, listen to some pastors on TV. And uh, Dr. David Jeremiah this morning gave a, a sermon on, it was about, well, it, it went with Esther 414. Maybe I should read that. I have to take my glasses off and stand hard and tell where, but maybe, maybe I can do this. And Esther 4.14 reads, For if thou altogether holdest thy peace at this time, then shall their enlargement and deliverance arise to the Jews from another place, but thou and thy father's house shall be destroyed. And who knoweth whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this? Now, with that said, what you know the story uh, uh, of Malachi and, and Esther, and uh, uh, I'm going to read you what the commentator in, in my Bible has for that. After the decree to kill the Jews was given, I said Malachi, Mordecai, I'm sorry, and Mordecai and Esther could have despaired, decided to save other, other than, other, only themselves, or just waited for God's intervention. Instead, they saw that God had placed them in their positions for a purpose. So they seized the moment and acted. When it is within our reach to save others, we must do so. In a life-threatening situation, don't withdraw, behave selfishly or wallow in despair, or wait for God to fix everything. Instead, ask you where you are for such a time as this. So that brings us to the theme for this, uh, for yesterday and the day before. And we know that, that things have happened that, that led us to this big change. I mean, it is a big change. And if, if you could have been there and listened at what we did for two days or a day and a half, uh, it brings it into much more perspective. But as to where we're headed, not where we've been, that's behind us. You know, we're not worried about that. It's where we're headed. So anyway, 
Dr. David Jeremiah gave this sermon. He was talking about this little man, Epaphus, who started a church in Glossy. And all kinds of doctrines had entered into his little church. Now, Paul didn't start this church. This little man, Epaphus, started this church. And all kinds of doctrines had entered in. So he was overwhelmed and he, he wasn't theologically capable of handling all this. So he, he started looking for Paul. Paul's in prison. Not, he, no, he's not in prison. He's on house arrest. Chained to a Roman guard. 24 sevens. So he went to see Paul. He also got arrested, but good things came of it. There, therefore, we get the book of Coloss Colossians, which Paul wrote to the Colossians, or to the Colossians. And uh, it was all about The time that we're in, same as the time they were, the time we're in now, and the time they were in at this, at then. It's if you read it and, and study it, it's, it's so much the same. So this man took it upon himself to, to seek help and do what he could, and he did. And, and there was a good outcome to it all. So now I know I've taken enough time. I'm not going to say any more. There's other. I have other notes and all that. I will say one thing, because I don't know if Leon will touch on this, but one of the things that really struck me, uh, there was a lot of people that, had, and probably Leon will say something about this, but people spoke on, on Africa and what's going on there. They, we have six congregations, I think it is, in Africa now. Uh, there's, we had people there from Africa, Michigan, mich missionaries. And uh, there was talk of that through the CBC they had started, and, and I'm not exactly sure who gave this presentation, but I jotted it down. It really hit me. Uh, they, they started a training program. It, it's a, a girls' program, a training program for girls that had been... Uh, caught up in sex trafficking, young girls, and they were sold. Well, actually, I think the way it was told that families are so poor that maybe in some cases they sell their own so they can have money to live on. Uh, I'm, I'm talking about selling their own daughters, but into sex trafficking or for wives to somebody that, Maybe even they know. I'm not sure that I got that right, so don't hold me to that. But, but I think that's what came of it, or what it was said, how it was said. But anyway, they started this girls' program. And what they were doing was teaching girls skills. Now, we, we, here, in, we don't even understand such a thing. But, but they teach these girls skills so that when they learn skills, then they can be a benefit to the family. They can go out and work or do, or do these whatever skills it is to get paid for and to help support the families. Well, by that happening, then they don't get sold for whatever. If it's a family selling them or what, they don't get sold because they're helping. They're contributing to the family. And then... That's not all of it. They teach them Jesus Christ. Then what they do is they teach their family, and their family teaches somebody else. And it's that snowball effect that is so tremendous in a place like Africa. I'm going to let Leon talk. <laughs> Thank you all. He could have kept going, couldn't he? He was doing good. I, I'm going to give you just a, a few. I'll sit down in case you've got a question. 
<laughs> <I'm going laughs> I might need to uh, give you a few numbers that was there. Uh, congregations, there was a total of 40 congregations, different churches represented at this conference. Uh, delegates, 94. Non-delegates, 164. And the total was 270. 270 people was at this conference. And the total pastors that was there was 43. So it really wasn't a big group per se, but it's a start. It's a start point for us. Uh, this was the second annual conference. The first one was at Antioch uh, Church in Woodstock. That was where the first one was done. This was the second one. Last year we had a COVID problem, so we didn't have one. But this was our second, so we're looking forward to, to keep going. And I was on the uh, planning program to get this thing to do what we did. And we're, we're, I'm hoping we're, we took a, and gave an evaluation sheet out yesterday to all the people that was there. And hopefully that they wrote on there what they seen wrong and what we can do to improve. And Delmas did mark a lot of the things that we need to do to improve to make it a better con uh, conference for everybody. So I, we're hoping and, and we hope that they'll bring them to the, to the planning committee to make changes that we can make the conference a little bit better. Uh, as Delma said, we did a lot of singing. There was there was spatial music and they did a lot of singing. So, but it was a good it was good music. I can't knock the music. It was good. Did you speak about the girl Cora? No. And what was her dad's name? The, the Cora, the girl that did the spatial music or did the oh, Craig Allen Myers. Craig Allen Myers. It was his daughter, but that's not her last name now because she's married. But uh, this little girl, a uh, woman, I'll say it a woman because she was married, small, very small in stature. Whew. What a voice. What a voice. When she stood, she stood back like this, and really, she filled the room. Uh, now my mind went blank, blank uh, they almost uh, what things that's going to cover. But we did have a good time. Uh, Friday night, they took up an offering, and that offering brought $15,232. And I'm talking 200, 270 people now. Uh, Saturday, they took up another offering, and it got $5,191 for a total of $20,123. And that's just so two days. Individual. That's just those individuals that sat there. 270 people that gave. Uh, I'll let Craig give you his report. But he, he was, um, uh, there, were, there was actually eight, eight committees that was formed, uh, one being ministerial outreach, disaster support, and evangelism, and uh, ministerial leadership, stewards, which that's your money, uh, Legal, which is policy and uh, uh, polity, uh, structure and, and regional development, ministerial training, uh, public relations, public news, and that's Craig's, one of Craig's. And then the alt and, and youth uh, fellowship mission, and that's another one of his. And then Jim Myers gave a question answer time, and I was the timekeeper. I sat up front. And, and it had two lights that I turned on. When people stood up, if they took too long, I start putting lights on, and they knew they needed to stop. So that I happened to be the timekeeper. John was just asking me if I wanted to put a light on you. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> yes, no, yes, ahead. come out here where I can see it, though. <laughs> anyway, we we did. We enjoyed our time. It, it was a little. Hard setting for three hours or so, but uh, those guys gave you information after information that that let us, you know, let us know where our congregation, you know, that how things were coming, how how our uh, group, the Covenant Brethren Church, how it's going forward, 
everything was amazing to us. It, we, you know, just all kinds of information was coming our way. So you need to, you don't have to be a delegate to go. But I, if I understand correctly, we got, we're going to elect three this year. We're going at our fall council, uh, council meeting, we will elect three, not two like we always did before. We're going to elect three because we're allowed to. We're with, with, for national, for what we uh, get sent there. So keep that in mind. I need, we need three people. So, all right. Is there any questions that you'd like to ask? I'll get Delma to answer them. Any questions? We thank you very much. I will say this. They, the, the host put on a, a really good, uh, well, a meal for one thing, yeah. but the whole thing was, was really good. And, it, it, I mean, this was, we got some good people in the CBC, right down to the technology and all that. It is amazing what they, they did, and, and it, was, it was really a good convention now and but the meal all oh, those people put on a meal you wouldn't believe in what was the guy's name i gotta tell this the guy that ate so much mike saturday pastor <laughs> you you don't well, know why do you hear this no, why, why do you mind. hear this oh uh, camille will tell you we told we spent the whole class discussing uh, down the stairs we <laughs> didn't we didn't do anything else they asked questions so we just we just started talking and telling them about it but this guy was amazing oh such a nice guy but Pastor, he was pastoring about this tall and skinny. Oh, I'd love to be that skinny. But I don't know where it went from his toes to his head. It had to. <laughs> Are you going to tell him what he ate? No. <laughs> <laughs> he might be listening to this. <laughs> Thank you all. It was, I, I spent most of my time with the youth on Saturday uh, doing our first annual youth conference. Wasn't a lot of youth there, but the ones that were there, we had a great time, and uh, it went really well, and I appreciated the opportunity to do that. And they, they came up with a bunch of plans. Um, one of the big things, and I, I realize I didn't plan on taking it. If you're visiting here today, this is boring to you. I'm sorry. But um, one of the big things that went on uh, Friday night was uh, Lynn Rystrom from Samaritan's Purse got up and shared the ministry of Samaritan's Purse. And we all knew the ministries of Samaritan's Purse. I don't think any of us understood the scope of what they're doing. Um, it was incredible. But then at the end, she said, we want you to understand we're not asking you to partner with us. We want to partner with you. We want to join with you. And uh, Samaritan's Purse has asked Covenant Brethren Church if they can partner with us. And uh, obviously we agreed to do that. And uh, so that opens all kinds of doors for us in uh, local ministry and, and other areas uh, of ministry uh, as far as disaster response and all kinds yeah. of other things. Um, the impact that she was sharing with the group that just the shoe boxes have. You have no idea how many people are coming to Christ through the shoe box ministry. Through those shoe boxes you pack, there are thousands of people coming to Christ every year because of those shoe boxes. Over a thousand churches are being started every year because of those shoe boxes. It's incredible, the ministry that's taking place. So, anyhow, well, sure. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Uh-huh.
Yeah. They ask everybody that came to the conference to bring some canned goods. Just bring some canned goods with you. We'll collect them and we'll take them to rescue mission. And there's two pickup loads of food that, that went out to the rescue that's mission. That's that, yeah, that's not... Yeah, that's, that's two big filled up pickup truckloads. Uh, they could have probably spread it into a third and been it probably would have gone better. But anyhow... Uh, it, it went really well, and, and that was appreciated. It was, it was a good, you need to make plans. I don't know. This year it was close. It was a Fairmont State University. Next year it may be down in the Carolinas or Tennessee or someplace like that. Might be more difficult to get to, but you really ought to try and go to it sometime. Uh, it would be a blessing to you. Well, I can see I'm going to have to use uh, the accordion on the sermon today a little bit, but uh, we'll try not real accordion. I'm going to have to squeeze it down a little bit, but we'll uh, we'll try and, and that's okay. We'll try and uh, just take care of a couple of announcements real quick. Uh, first of all, Tuesday night Bible study, as always. Uh, that'll be online. Go ahead. Men's fellowship is not Wednesday. It is Thursday. We moved it from Wednesday to Thursday, and I goofed up. So um, anyhow, don't come Wednesday. Nobody will be here. Uh, there you go. Come Thursday. John took care of it for us. And we'll get it right, okay? Um, we're needing to start to sign up teachers and workers for, va for Vacation Bible School. And so if you're willing to help with that, next week there'll be a sign-up sheet in the back for you to sign up on. And you can be thinking about it. We've selected the Bible School theme and the material. And Holly, if you're going to help with music again this year, ha, 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 hi. Um, <laughs> I'm getting a look. I hope you... Anyhow... If you can, the, the, the music is here. If you can't, I understand, okay? Um, but that'll be, we, we uh, are going to be starting with that. Um, church picnic is July 20th, just to let you know so you can be planning for it. 6.30 down at the church pavilion. And I think I have this right. Uh, Juanita, the women usually provide like the hot dogs, and everybody just brings the other stuff. Cover dish, yep. Camp coming up. Actually, youth camp starts next Sunday. We'll be leaving for youth camp next Sunday. Um, go ahead. Food pantry continue. Just That's just a continual reminder. Food pantry is always in need of food. Go ahead. Um, also a reminder, different places you can send your tithes and offerings and how you can do that. All right. Are there, is there anything I have overlooked or messed up on or need to announce that I, for, that I failed to mention? want to take a minute for prayer requests. Do we have any prayer requests this morning? We want to continue to pray for Carolyn Goldeisen. She's on her list and recovering right now. Um, others? Yes. Kathy Propst. Okay. Mm -hmm. Kevin Barger. Better known as Fuzz. Okay. Jeff? Jimmy Hedrick family, okay. Also, Jeff's been going through some tough times. He's on our prayer list, but keep him in your prayers. Others. Any unspoken requests this morning? Whole room full of those, okay. Well, let's just go to the Lord in prayer at this time, shall we? Heavenly Father, Regardless of how busy we become in our, in our service, we don't ever want to fail to take the time to give serious attention to praying for the needs of others. Father, one of the things that you've called us to be, one of the ministries you've given us, is the ministry of intercession. And so, Father, we come to you this morning asking that you intercede in the lives of all of these individuals who have been mentioned, both in spoken and unspoken requests. Father, we pray that you'll touch their hearts, that we pray you'll touch their bodies, whatever the need might be that they're faced with, whether it be a physical need, a spiritual need, a, a need for guidance or comfort, or, or whatever the need might be, Father, we pray that you will meet them at their point of need. We thank you, Father, for the privilege of coming into your presence and being able to lift these needs up before you. And we pray, Father, that you're glorified as prayers get answered. 
And people's lives are touched, not because of us, but because of your great love and mercy. Father, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You've been sitting for a little while. We're going to stand and we're just going to do one of our worship songs. But Donna, come on up. We'll just do the first one. Actually, let's do the... That's fine. We'll do the first one. God, I look to you. Come help this morning. Good. Let's stand together, shall we? staying at the hotel and he said pastor craig something i don't understand he said uh how he said how long have you been preaching at our church and i told him and he said how do you keep finding something different to preach on every sunday 
after all those years, how do you keep finding something different to preach on? I said, I don't know. That's part of just asking God what he wants you to do. And I said, this week I was thinking about Independence Day. I was thinking about the freedom we enjoy. And freedom made me think about what gives us freedom and what takes freedom from us. And that led me to think about this. And that he said, that's too much thinking. One of the things that I was challenged with many years ago when we first started taking short-term mission trips, Dale Lusk stood in front of our group of kids in uh, Reynosa, Mexico, stood in front of our group that we were there with Youth for Christ Ministries, and he looked at all of us and he said, I want you to understand something. He said, this isn't a very comfortable place. And you're going to have to use outhouses. There's only four showers for 75 people. Um, You're going to sleep on the ground in tents. It's not going to be all that comfortable. It's going to be difficult. He said, I want you to get it. This isn't about you. This isn't about serving you. This isn't about your comfort. This trip isn't about you. It's about you coming to serve others. And those words hit me, this isn't about you, and I've never forgot that life in serving God is not supposed to be about me. It's not supposed to be about whether I get patted on the back. It's not supposed to be about whether somebody recognizes what we do. It's not about me, it's about Christ. Sarah gave me a book many years ago uh, about, I think it was a book, it might have been a CD, about giving glory to God, and about how, how we are created to give glory to God. Do you remember that? And I, that, that had such an impact on me, that the idea that my purpose, my number one purpose, your number one purpose as a Christian, is to give glory to God, not to get glory for yourself. It's not about us. But sometimes we fall in a situation where we ask ourselves the question, what's wrong with me? What's going on with me? We blow up at our kids. We blow up at a co-worker. We do things that we shouldn't do. And we ask ourselves afterwards, what's wrong with me? What made me do that? We come home from the store. None of you have ever done this. You come home from the store with something you didn't need and don't really want. And you look at it and think, why did I buy that? What's wrong with me? Anybody ever do that? You don't have to raise your hand. We hear about somebody else's vacation or their promotion. And we're mad that we didn't get to do that or that we didn't get that promotion. And then instead of of being happy for them, we think to ourselves, what is wrong with me? Moments like this, we realize that there's something internally not right. Something that keeps robbing us of our joy, wreaking havoc in our relationships, ruining our witness as followers of Christ. We're sick on the inside. We can't figure out what's going on. We're not our best selves. And we're not getting better. And we ask ourselves, what's wrong? Well, what's wrong is that we're sinful. That's not a pleasant or a popular diagnosis, but it's the truth. No matter how much we protest, no matter how much we try to do better, no matter how much we lean on other people, we begin to, it begins to dawn on us that there's something wrong on the inside of us and we keep struggling with it and we keep fighting with it. How did that happen? What, if anything, can make it better? Well, I want to very quickly give you a background. I don't have time to go into all the seven deadly sins. But I want to give you a background on the seven deadly, or on the deadly sins. They're called the seven deadly sins. They didn't originate with Brad Pitt in the movie in the 90s. That's not where that thing came from. They go back a lot farther than that. They first show up in Proverbs 6.16, where it says, These are the six things things the Lord hates, seven that are detestable to Him. Then he goes on to list a collection of seven vices, and you ought to look that up sometime because it'll shock you what those things are that God hates. One of them is gossip, backbiting. So God hates it. The list we were, the list that's called the seven deadly sins came out of a monastic movement 
in the early church around the third century, God-seeking men and women decided they were going to get away from the world. They thought it was the world that was polluting them, and if they just get away to themselves, they could get away and they could live a life of to in total harmony with God. And then they found out even as they got away and they were by themselves or just in small groups of people that were dedicated to living lives with God, they found out that they were still having these same struggles in their life, and they came to realize that these things are inside of us. Today, because we're celebrating Independence Day this weekend, we're going to look at the sin that robs freedom from the life of an individual, the sin of pride. You say, well, how can pride rob us of freedom? You can't just overcome it. We're not only going to look at the sin, we're going to look at the corresponding virtue that if we put that in place how it'll help us. But people think, you know, okay, I, I have this struggle. Maybe pride is something that's there. But there's no pill you can go take. There's no doctor you can go to and have a doctor say, here, take this pill and it'll give you humility. It's something we struggle with. You can't just grit your teeth and say, okay, I'm not going to be proud. I'm going to be a humble person. It doesn't work that way. In fact, sometimes that creates problems. The sin of pride. The Bible clearly names pride as a sin, one of the ways that we fall short of the glory of God. We could point to all the kinds of verses in the Old Testament and New Testament to do it, like Proverbs 16, for example, verses 18 and 19, says, Pride goes before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall. Better to be lowly in spirit along with the oppressed than to share plunder with the proud. The New Testament continues along the same lines. Jesus confronts pride over and over again with the religious leaders in his time. He wrote in Philippians, Paul wrote in Philippians chapter 2 verse 3, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather in humility value others above yourself. Later on in James chapter 4 verse 6, Referencing an Old Testament teaching, James says, That is why Scripture says God oppresses the proud but shows favor to the humble. Throughout the Bible, it becomes clear that God has zero tolerance for pride in the sense that he's addressing here. The dictionary defines pride as a feeling of deep pleasure or satisfaction derived from a person's own achievements. That doesn't sound that bad, does it? I mean, think about it. Doesn't sound like that should be listed as a deadly sin. I mean, murder, yes. Um, you know, lying, stealing, robbery, drunkenness, hatred, any of those things, yes. But pride, that doesn't sound like that could be a deadly sin. Maybe greed, maybe lust. These things are unseemly and, and, and cause us to stumble in a lot of different ways. But deadly? Pride? What's wrong with a feeling of pleasure or appreciation or satisfaction that comes from some achievement that you've had? What's wrong with feeling proud about something you've done well? Isn't self-esteem a good thing? I mean, isn't that something we strive for and try to teach our kids to have? The fact is, here in America, we're proud of being proud. Look at the magazines at the checkout counter. All the beautiful people there. All their accomplishments listed. All the things they've done. They're very proud of all the things they've done. Very proud of their abs. They're always showing their abs. You notice that? Showing their washboard abs. I have washboard abs. They're just well padded. So nobody gets hurt by them. <laughs> We believe that there's nothing wrong with everybody having their 15 minutes of fame. We have whole television shows highlighting people's accomplishments in their singing or in their abilities that they do. And we give them their moment of fame, their moment in the spotlight. And we say, you should be proud of what you accomplish. So what's wrong with that? What's so deadly about pride? The problem with pride from a biblical perspective is that it leaves God out of the picture. Pride in an accomplishment that doesn't recognize God 
become something that's terribly deadly. It fails to recognize that God is great and worthy to be praised. That any human achievement is only possible by His grace and His goodness. It pushes God off the throne. Sets Him aside and says, I am the one that I'm elevating. I am the one that deserves the pat on the back. And shoves God out of the picture. And Once we become the center of our, of our own universe, everything else takes second place. Everything about God takes takes second place. God becomes an afterthought if we think about Him at all. From a biblical perspective, we can define pride as an unholy preoccupation with self. There's nothing wrong with being occupied with ourselves to a certain degree, attending to our needs, taking care of ourselves, nothing wrong with that. But the problem with pride is we become occupied with ourselves first above everything else. And we forget that life is not about us. We forget that this isn't about us, that our existence isn't about us. It's about glorifying God. It's about being His hands and feet here on this planet while we have life and breath here. We know that as a deadly sin, pride traditionally appears at the top of the list. If these sins are deadly, then pride is the deadliest because it separates us from God. It pushes God out of the picture and focuses only on ourselves. When pride has its way with us, we end up, we end up exalting ourselves. We end up serving ourselves and contemplating only on our own needs and our own wants. Trusting only in ourselves. Instead of exalting and serving and contemplating and trusting God. Pride is the ultimate form of, of adultery. <coughs> it's been with us for a very long time. Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden is where it started. The original sin... The original sin with Lucifer, he thought he could be like God. He was going to exalt himself to be God. And then when Adam and Eve came along, he told Adam and Eve, Look, the only reason God told you not to eat of the tree of good and evil is because God knew that if you ate of that tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you would be like God. And their ears pricked up and their eyebrows went up and they thought, Be like God. Lots of us have words to describe a proud person. Arrogant, egotistical, conceited, vain, self-centered, self-absorbed. We've heard all of those terms. The problem is almost everybody around us knows if pride is a problem for us before we do. They see it in us before we ever see it in ourselves. So what are the symptoms with an unholy preoccupation with self? Name dropping, mirror looking, calling attention to yourself, putting other people down, choosing friends based on what they do for your image, always having to get your way, needing to win every argument, grabbing credit wherever you can, never being able to apologize, leaving God out of the conversation thinking that things are only about you, my guess is somewhere in that list from time to time, you can find yourself. When we were at the conference Friday night, Lynn Reinstra was up on the platform and she had done this amazing presentation. And she had said that um, the group was going to get to go to, the, the group of leaders, the leadership team was going to get to go to uh, North Carolina down to the leadership or to Samaritan's first headquarters to tour the headquarters and I couldn't help myself I had to turn around and and tell Delmas boy I'm looking I'm really looking forward to going there and I and and I said I was one of the four that got to meet with her originally I wanted him to know that I was special enough that I got to meet with the person that was second in command under under Franklin Graham. It was name dropping. 
I wanted him to know that I was special, that I was going to get to go do that. I, I don't think I literally thought about it that way when I was saying it, but that was what was, I, I just wanted him to know, hey, I, I'm proud of this. I'm going to get to go do that. I ought to take myself off the list just for feeling that way. That's where, that's, isn't it easy? Isn't it so easy how we get sucked into that? Isn't it so easy how we get drawn into that? We want people to know, hey, look at me. I'm something special. Now listen, you are special. But you're not special because of what you've done. You're special because God made you special. God created you just the way you are to be the person you are. And you're special in God's eyes. And you're special in God's heart. And he loved you enough that he gave his son to die for you. Yes, you're special. But not because you've done something great. But because God made you great. We have to learn the importance of humility. I have to learn the importance of the lively virtue of humility. James says in chapter 4, verse 6, scripture we already read, God opposes the proud but shows favor to the what? Humble. God shows favor to the humble. Like pride, humility is one of those virtues that's easy to spot but hard to define. I looked uh, looked humble up in the dictionary, and you know what it says? (laughs) It says the lack of pride. (coughs) So we look at what the scripture has to say about it. In Romans chapter 12, verse 3, it says, For... For by the grace given to me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourselves more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourselves with sober judgment in accordance with the faith that God has distributed to each of you. We're not supposed to think too highly of ourselves. That's pride. We're not supposed to think too lowly of ourselves either. We're to think of ourselves sober, as sober. With sound judgment. The New Living Translation puts it this way. Be honest. Listen to this. Be honest in your evaluation of yourselves. Be honest, sober. That honest, sober evaluation is not based on what others think of us. Or what we think of us. But rather on what God thinks of us. In accordance with the faith that God has distributed to each of you. Learn to see yourself as God sees you. Special, yes. He loves you, yes. A sinner saved by grace, yes. Years ago, I came across the uh, definition of humility in the writings of Thomas Merton. He said, humility is being precisely the person you actually are before God. Think about that a minute. Humility is being precisely the person you actually are before God. Humility isn't thinking poorly of yourself. It's not beating yourself up or neglecting yourself or minimizing your worth or saying I'm some lowly person. It's simply being honest with yourself and others about how God really sees you and what's really going on with you. The starting point of every person is that we're made in the image and likeness of God. So that starts with something special. We're destined for eternal glory if you're a child of God. You're gifted to do something beautiful and special in this world. But look at how Merton completes his thought. He starts by saying humility is being precisely the person you actually are before God. And if you have the humility to be yourself, you will not be like anyone else in the whole universe. There's not another Chad Vance anywhere on the planet. I thought I'd get an amen out of Amy. Either an amen or an oh my. I didn't know which. You are special. You're unique. That's great. Do you know how much freedom this brings? When you know precisely who you are before God and Christ, it sets you free. 
You're free to admit that you're a sinner. You're free to say, I'm sorry. You're free to have, to, to have, to having to, you're, you're free to not having to manage other people's problems or impressions of you. You're free to not have to worry about the status you have because of the friends you hang around or what your kids do. You're free to do good without needing people to notice what you do. You're free to let others have their way. You're free to lose graciously. You're free to rejoice if someone else succeeds or experiences some kind of good fortune because you know exactly who you are and there's no one else in the whole universe like you. So you don't have to be jealous of them. If that's not the basis for self-esteem, I don't know what is. So in conclusion, I just want to say this. I want to wrap this up with this thought. And I wrote the whole thought down up there for you. This weekend we celebrate the freedom that came to our country so many years ago. If you were at the fireworks last night, if you were at the celebrations, it was a time of joy and celebration and relaxing, and we just enjoyed it. We celebrate the continued freedom we enjoy, and we should. There's nothing wrong with that. But the greatest freedom that we have was paid for on the cross over 2,000 years ago. It's a freedom that allows us to let go of ourselves and embrace what we are in Christ. We are what God made us, exactly the way He wanted us to be. We're free to serve Him and those around us. That's true freedom. Do you know that freedom or are you trapped by the desire to impress? Or are you trapped by the desire to live up to a certain standard? Are you trapped by your own personal expectations of yourself? What is it that's taking freedom from you? I will tell you it's probably based on pride. Pride that you want people to see you a certain way. You want to be a certain thing instead of just being what you are in Christ. Now I have to say something to you real quick this morning. You guys are a little subdued this morning. I think maybe you've had too much 4th of July party. I don't know. Maybe you ate too much yesterday. Anybody do that? Mm -hmm. A little subdued this morning. But please hear what I'm saying. Live in humility. Christ took off, a, off his cloak and he put on... He put a towel around him and he went around and he washed his disciples' feet. An ultimate act of humility and service. And he said, now what I've done, you ought to do also. You need to have that same attitude. You need to have that same service. You need to be willing to humble yourself and be the person God wants you to be and humbly serve him. Can you do that? Can I do that? It's a question for all of us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for reminding us through your word that there's really nothing more destructive in our lives than beginning to think too much of ourselves. It's easy when people come around and pat you on the back and tell you how good you've done at something to believe that we're something better than somebody else. But Father, the truth is we're no better or no worse than anybody else. We are who you made us to be. And we should never get too caught up in thinking that we are somehow superior. We are who you made us to be. And that's special enough. And that's exciting enough. Father, let us find the freedom of humility and not be bound by the chains of pride. Father, direct the message to each heart in the way that you desire them to receive it. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing our closing hymn of invitation this morning, Take Time to Be Holy. And the invitation is very simple this morning. I'm not asking you to come up and confess, I've got a problem with pride. Because we all do from time to time. I'm not asking you to come up and deal with that. I'm asking you to, this thing is driving me crazy today. I'm asking you to say,
I'm asking you to say, Lord, show me who I am. Help me to look at myself and show me who I am. And if there's something you need to talk to God about that, either where you're sitting in your seat right now, or if you want to come and kneel at this altar and just say, Lord, show me what I need to do with this message. Show me what I need to do with this truth and help me to do it. If you're here today and you don't know Christ as your Savior, I invite you to come and let me show you from God's Word how you can do that this morning. If God's spoken to your heart. Won't you respond to Him in some way? Let's stand together as we sing. play through one final verse and I want everybody to bow their heads and close their eyes and just spend a minute talking to God and say God if there's something in my heart that you need to reveal to me that's a pride issue please do it now and show me how I can deal with it and I want to turn it over to you as Sue plays through this last verse won't you just give that time of prayer to God Come to a time where we are ready to leave this place. Help us, Father, to look beyond ourselves and to look to you and to embrace what we are to be in you instead of what we think we ought to be. Father, bless the message to your name's glory. Use this day to glorify yourself and give us the freedom that you desire us to have through Christ. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.